Hello, uh, welcome back. So, <clears throat> so uh, as the second speaker of this morning, uh, we have Kriya Kos uh, from CERN in Groningen, uh, telling us about probing the interior of a typical black, black hole microstate. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to be in this uh, beautiful new campus of ICTS. It's my first time here. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. So in my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, one particular question, which is uh, uh, I will explore a question, which is what is the bulk dual geometry of a typical black hole microstate in the context of ADCFT. And I will uh, explain a little bit later what I mean by typical state. Uh, but for now, let me say that the reason that we are interested in this question is that <clears throat> it is uh, it may be closely related to the black hole information paradox, uh, which has uh, also been uh, related to the question of the smoothness of black hole horizon. And this question is particularly well defined uh, for black holes in ADS, for typical black holes in ADS. But more generally, uh, by definition, typical states represent uh, the vast majority of, of microstates that you count by the beggestein hawking entropy formula. So, of course, it would be nice to know what geometry we should associate to those states. So in my talk, I will present a, a conjecture, which is that the extended source geometry, um, including part of the left region, uh, may be relevant for uh, describing a typical black hole uh, state in ADCFT. And uh, I will, uh, in particular, uh, as evidence in favor of this conjecture, I will try to argue that the Hilbert space of the conformal field theory contains states which correspond to excitations of the, of the extended ads uh, geometry. Uh, then I will describe a proposal uh, for a one-sided version of the gauge jafferis wall uh, uh, traversable wormhole protocol that uh, Juan explained in the previous lectures. And we will try to use this protocol to probe uh, the, this region, uh, the left region of the uh, edge social geometry. And if I have time, I will also discuss some uh, uh, amusing connections with the Hyde and Presky protocol um, for information recovery from black holes. And uh, the material in my talk, uh, part of it is based on earlier work with uh, Suvrat, and uh, some of it on more recent work uh, by myself and uh, Jan de Boer, um, Rick van Brooklyn, who is my student uh, at CERN, Sagar Lokhande, who is a PhD student in Amsterdam, and uh, Eric Verlinden. So, uh, yeah, and some of this is work in progress. All right, so let me now remind you why the information paradox uh, is relevant here. So the original formulation of the paradox was in terms of properties of the Hawking radiation at infinity, and whether this is a, a pure state or not. But in uh, the uh, last uh, uh, decades, it has, been, uh, be, it has become clear that this paradox has another aspect, which has to do with the smoothness of the horizon. In particular, it is difficult to uh, reconcile unitary evaporation with uh, the correct entanglement of the quantum fields near, near the horizon, and this led to the firewall controversy, and a lot of work came out of it. But uh, one important uh, development which came from this debate is that this paradox was reformulated in such a way that it could be applied to big black holes in ADS. So a big black hole in ADS is in, stable, is in equilibrium uh, with its Hawking radiation. It does not evaporate. Nevertheless, uh, it is possible to formulate a firewall-like paradox, uh, which was uh, um, formulated by these authors, and which can be applied to these stable black holes. And this paradox suggests that big black holes in ADS uh, may have a singular horizon. And the importance of this uh, formulation is that uh, this is a rather precise uh, way of uh, addressing the paradox uh, where everything is in the context of ADS-FT and we're talking about a big ADS black hole. So let me uh, remind you very quickly what the paradox is. If you look at a black hole in ADS and you try to do effect field theory, and if you assume that there is a region behind the horizon, then you need to find some modes for the quantum fields in the interior. But if you look at uh, the commutators of these modes with the boundary Hamiltonian, uh, which you can compute from effective field theory, you find that creating particles in the interior of, uh, in this region lowers the, the energy of the CFT. So we add particles and we lower the energy, and uh, intuitively this seems like an unstable um, situation. And in fact, you can show that there's a mathematical inconsistency between this uh, algebra that you get from effect field theory and uh, um, the density of states on the boundary. In particular, you can, uh, using this algebra, uh, if you assume that this algebra holds for typical states, then uh, you can show that the expectation value of the number operator for most behind the horizon would have to be negative, which is inconsistent given that this is a, this is a positive operator, a non-negative operator. So this naively suggests that these operators B tilde uh, do not exist in the conformal field theory, and the horizon of a big ADS black hole would be singular for typical states, and the black hole would have no interior. 
Okay, so let me emphasize that this paradox uh, is formulated for typical states, which have to be distinguished from states that you form by gravitational collapse. So if you form a black hole in ADS, a big black hole in ADS, by collapsing a shell of matter, uh, you get a state which is not typical. Um, by this, uh, we mean that if you estimate how many states you can form by collapsing uh, some amount of matter in ADS in a relatively simple way, then you get a subleading uh, a, a small part of states compared to Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, so instead, what we will be talking about are typical states, which are defined in the following way. We select some energy window, uh, a very uh, small energy window centered around in naught, and we consider all energy eigenstates of the CFT in that window, and we write down a random superposition of those eigenstates. Now, these uh, coefficients ci are random complex numbers which have to be selected by uh, the Haar measure, and this defines standard microcanonical measure for pure states in any statistical system. One important property, so whenever I talk about typical states in the rest of my talk, I will be referring to states of this, of this form. So one important property of, this black hole, of these states is that they're uh, almost time independent. Uh, in particular, if you take any operator A and you compute the time derivative on this state, uh, you can write the result in terms of the, these coefficients and the matrix elements of the operator. And because uh, these uh, coefficients were selected randomly and their phases are completely random, th they will be typically be uncorrelated with the phases of, the, of A, A, J, and you can estimate the size of the sum and it turns out to be exponentially small in the entropy. So these states seem to be in equilibrium, typical states seem to be in equilibrium with excellent uh, accuracy. Yes? So is there, is there any way to I mean, see what this E0 value will be? I mean, uh, what E0 is? E0, yeah. You can, you can select it to be whatever you like, but uh, you'd better take it to be high enough so that uh, you are in the regime which is dominated by big black holes in ADS. So this would be a number which is order n squared times some number of order one. This is up to means us. Means, uh, what Sorry? Means this is up to us that what we choose is zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this is related to the mass of the black hole, so you can look at black holes of different mass, yes. Yes. When you say that black holes formed by gravitation collapse are atypical, what are you assuming about the configuration that is falling? Well, I, 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 that's why I, I have this word simple there. I, I mean, uh, we think of some shell of matter or that we throw some something from the boundary in a, like, a short amount of time. Because if you, um, if you try to form a black hole by gravitation collapse in a very complicated way by you know, throwing in very, you know, particles over a very long period of time, maybe also removing particles and throwing in more particles, it may be possible to approach uh, typical states. So here I'm talking about more conventional standard gravitational collapse. So the, um, so the states are almost time independent, and the question is what is the dual geometry? So it can't be this one, because this is time dependent. It has to be a different geometry. So the most conservative, uh, well, what we know for sure is that the exterior region uh, will be described by the ads schwarzschild geometry. Uh, how do we know that? Well, this follows from basic uh, uh, arguments in statistical mechanics, like typicality and the, uh, the ETAs, uh, which uh, basically say that uh, uh, if you compute single trace correlators on the boundary on a pure state, and if you co compare them to the thermal state, they will be very close, and as a result, this region will be uh, the same as the ads schwarzschild geometry at large n. And the question then is, uh, is this the only part of the geometry, or can we continue the geometry behind the horizon in some way? So, um, now, if, the future, if we assume for a moment <clears throat> that the future horizon is smooth, and that there is some space-time behind the horizon, that space-time, uh, it is natural to expect that that space-time will be consistent with the approximate time killing isometry of the exterior, uh, because the boundary state is almost time independent. So uh, if you assume that there is some space time behind the future horizon, it's natural to expect that this space time will be simply the, the, the usual continuation of the, of the Schwarzschild geometry behind the horizon. And uh, so we will expect to have this type of uh, geometry in the, in the future waves. Uh, but another observation is that uh, these typical states that we're talking about are uh, invariant under time reversal. So uh, if, you, if we assume that there's a future wedge, uh, it is natural to expect that uh, in some sense uh, the geometry may also contain the past wedge. And then if, you're, if, you, uh, if, you have, if, if we accept that the dual geometry will contain these three states, it's very natural to expect that it will also contain part of the left region because we can have excitations which are created here and they can travel in, in both ways and then meet again in the future ways. 
So if you want to write down the geometry, uh, dual to a typical state, which is consistent with the killing isometry, you don't have many options. One is to assume there's a firewall in the horizon and you only have the exterior, and the other is to consider some part of this extended ADS roll to geometry. Now, we, of course, we don't expect uh, to be able to uh, go all the way to the left uh, asymptotic region because that will be, uh, we only have one CFT. I want to emphasize that everything I'm talking about is about a typical pure state in, a one, in one conformal field theory. So we do not expect to be able to reconstruct the full left wedge. That's why I have introduced this, uh, this, this, this boundary, this cutoff, um, which, uh, again, uh, it's natural to expect it to be consistent with the killing isometry of a diagram. So it, m it must be some surface, which is an orbit of this killing vector field, which could be very close to the bifurcation surface, or it could be f further out. And later, I will try to give some estimates about where this could possibly be. So I will start explaining uh, wh what happens uh, in the future ways, and then I will try to uh, see how we can uh, uh, reconstruct the remaining two regions. So regarding the future ways, I already told you that it's not so easy to reconstruct it because of this uh, argument of um, AMSES and Marlof and Polczynski. But uh, in previous work with Suvrat, we made a proposal about how we could possibly identify a CFT operators or tilde, which play the roles of the modes that I called uh, B tilde in the previous diagram. Uh, sorry, so this modes B tilde. So. In, in this proposal uh, with Surat, we, um, we basically identified this operator so tilde uh, in a way which, uh, uh, so this operator was selected by, the, by their entanglement with the field outside the horizon. And because of that, these are state dependent operators. So they depend on the microstate. And using these operators, we propose that we can reconstruct uh, local bulk fields behind the future horizon in the future weights. And uh, uh, well, this proposal predicts that the typical black hole will have a smooth future uh, horizon and a smooth future interior. So part of this region exists in the, in the bulk. So let me, uh, yeah. So in, the, in, that, in that picture, the fact that you have a cutoff, is that related to the fact that uh, this is a one-sided CFT, and if you yes. had infinite resolution, you would go all the way? Or, or infinite, yes, that's right. Something like that. Yes, but I will try to explain why, how this cutoff might arise uh, from the formalism. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me now uh, very briefly uh, review this construction. I will only sp spend two slides on that, and then I will move on to uh, some other stuff. So the idea is to uh, start with introducing a small algebra of simple operators, which you can think of as being made out of light, single trace operators, and a small number of products, small relative to capital N. And also we introduce uh, something that we call the small Hilbert space or uh, the cold subspace, which is what you get by acting on the, the black hole microstate that you start with by elements of this algebra. So this is a small subspace of the full Hilbert space, the theory. And uh, then the important observation is that this algebra probes a typical state as a thermal state. So correlators on, the on this typical state of elements of the algebra are uh, similar to thermal correlators. And this has an important uh, algebraic uh, um, implication, which is that uh, you cannot find any annihilation operators in this algebra uh, A. Why is that? Well, suppose you act with what would normally be an annihilation operator on the typical state psi. Uh, if you look at the norm of the state, uh, it's given by this quantity. And since the state is, behaves like a thermal state, this will have some uh, thermal occupation uh, 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 dependence. So it, it's not going to be zero. It's going to be a positive number. So you cannot have in, find any annihilation operators in this algebra. And uh, this means that uh, this vector psi is a, a cyclic and separating vector for the algebra, which means that uh, this means that you can generate the Hilbert space, the small Hilbert space, by acting with elements of, on, of the algebra on the state psi. And separating means that uh, you cannot annihilate the state. And then there is a, an, a nice construction which says that the representation of this algebra on the small Hilbert space is reducible and you can find a non-trivial commutant, A prime. Commutant means that uh, these are operators which commute with all elements of the algebra. And this commutant acts on the same space. And moreover, this commutant is isomorphic to the original algebra. Yeah, this O is in A, yes. So. Uh, using this uh, construction, we can actually define these operators uh, by a set of linear equations, which tell us how these operators or tilde act on the state side that we started with, as well as or any other state that you can get inside this small subspace. You have some set of equations. I, I just want you to remember one important point, that these or tildes do not commute with Hamiltonian. And uh, these equations define these operators uh, on this small subspace, which is relevant for effective field theory experiments around a given black hole microstate. 
And because of that, these operators are not globally defined on the Hilbert space, and that's why we call them state-dependent operators. If you start with a different black or microstate, you will get a different set of operators. Uh, also, even though this equation seems to imply that this O and O tilde commute, uh, this uh, equation is true only inside the small subspace, not uh, as a fundamental operator equation on the full Hilbert space. And finally, uh, I, I want to mention that I want to define these operators, these equations, only for frequencies which have an upper cutoff that I will call omega star. This omega star can be very large, a very large uh, frequency. Uh, it may even be n-dependent, but we don't want it to grow too fast with n. So let, let me explain the motivation for introducing this cutoff. The entire construction is based on the idea that the small algebra uh, seems to be thermalized. But when you look at the thermal, thermal occupation levels, you notice that if you take a very high frequency, then this goes to zero very quickly, which means that if you look at modes with, with very high frequency, they will seem to be in the, in the ground state. And then this construction will become very difficult if, this, if these numbers become very small. So uh, for this reason, we want to impose conditions only for frequencies which are bounded from above by omega star, and this will be related to the cutoff of the left region, which I, I introduced in the previous slide. OK, so using this operator O and O tilde, uh, one can write down some uh, <clears throat> operator in the, in the CFT uh, whose correlation functions reproduce what you would calculate in effective field theory behind the horizon. And in particular, um, <clears throat> using uh, these uh, uh, operators, you, can, uh, you find that the, an infalling observer who uses these quantum fields would uh, detect a smooth horizon and a smooth interior. But if you look at these operators of tilde, they seem to be coming from the left region, right? So um, if you're willing to use these operators of tilde, uh, if they have some physical meaning, a natural question is, why don't we extend this diagram a little bit towards the left? Yes? Uh, here, this uh, cutoff is from zero yes. to in uh, yeah, omega star. Yeah, I'm sorry. This would have been omega star. Uh, and But you take that omega star to infinity or something here? Uh, like I don't know the precise relationship between omega star and n. OK. So uh, if you take omega star to be proportional to n or n squared, then you will run into problems for sure. But it could be that you can get away with taking omega to be of the order of log n, because then you get the factor of 1 over n there. So I don't know uh, what is the precise dependence of omega star on n at this point. So uh, if you start using these operators, then you can ask, why don't we extend this diagram in the past, right? Or in other words, uh, the <laughs> using this operator, we predict that this region has a, is smooth, and uh, an observer will detect this region. But you can write similar expressions for the field in the extended Penrose diagram, not only in the future wedge. Uh, in particular, you can write down uh, operators in the left wedge, which are made out of the O tildes only. Uh, and you can do a similar construction in the path uh, uh, wedge. So the proposal then is that uh, to explore the possibility that uh, the dual geometry uh, is the extended ad Schwarzschild uh, diagram, including part of the left region as well as the white and black hole regions. And um, as I mentioned before, this cutoff on the left is de de determined by this cutoff in the frequencies. The intuition here is that um, if you want to go very close to the left, um, to the left boundary, you need to use high frequency modes, right? Because to go near the boundary of ADS, you, you need high energy. So if you have a cutoff on this frequency omega star, then nothing can possibly get too close to this boundary. So this boundary is operationally meaningless. Nothing can probe it. So that's why we have this cutoff. And I want to emphasize that since these O tildes do not fundamentally commute with the O's, uh, this left region should not be thought of as an independent part of the Hilbert space, but it should be thought of as some, uh, um, in the spirit of black hole complementarity, as some way of encoding certain properties of the boundary safety correlators in a geometric way. So let me summarize. The conjecture is that the typical state should be associated with the following uh, geometry. And, uh, well, uh, well, one way to do it is uh, to, to, to motivate this conjecture is by writing down the local bulk field in these regions and computing correlators, but that will, that will work out, of course. Uh, however, we'd like to find some additional evidence. And one way to do it is to think about uh, the following logic. When we say that a particular state is dual to a particular geometry, uh, one of the things that we mean by that is that if you look at perturbations of the state on the boundary, uh, those perturbations should be related to the possible perturbations of the dual geometry. So if I look at the possible ways of perturbing this uh, geometry, they should have a, a simple and natural meaning in the ways I should be able to perturb the boundary state. Uh, 
So that's what we're going to do now. We'll try to identify perturbations in the conformal field theory which correspond to excitations uh, living in this region. Yes. Uh, why is O tilde not defined on the original asymptotic region? Uh, o tilde, is it zero on... Uh, well, uh, sorry, uh, fundamentally speaking, it is here. But um, it is useful to represent it as a field uh, in a space-like region for the purpose of computations in effect field theory. That's the logic. There's only one CFT, right? And these O tildes are operators in the CFT. But, but the O tildes, yeah, they act on the right side. Yeah, they act on the right side, but not geometric. I mean, they don't act in, the, like, in a simple way in the bulk. Yeah, so early on, people were worried that if the, each microstate corresponds to the geometry with a the horizon, then somehow you're overcounting the black hole entropy. I don't know. Uh, uh, well, I mean, even if we have a gas in a pure state uh, in, a, in a box, we can, uh, we, we can think of some coarse grained entropy for that gas, right? Even though it's a pure state. So uh, I don't know if there's a, like, a paradox. Be yeah. Well, everything I'm talking about is at large n, so these fluctuations are, are suppressed. Is it clear that in, in a in a typical state, this uh, there's like basically one bifurcation surface? Like, why can't you have like two horizons which are separated and so on? Uh, like, what happens, for example, in this multiple shock geometry that Shankar? Yeah, Shankar you mean if you start perturbing this? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean that's a good question. But uh, so what I'm talking about is uh, uh, taking a typical state. So there are no uh, multiple shocks or anything like that. It's a typical state. And I'm looking at very small perturbations around that typical state. I think for what you're talking about, we have to look at the back reaction of those excitations and then uh, evolve for some time, and then the state will be less typical. Uh, it's a good question, but I, I don't know how to answer that yet. I want to start with a typical state where there are no shock waves. I mean, I will put some shock waves now, but uh, the starting point should be a state without, which is really typical. So let me try to explain now how we can identify perturbations of the CFT. Um, and I will start with the most basic perturbations, uh, which is taking a, a typical state psi zero and act with a unitary. You can think of this unitary as being, for example, the exponential of some uh, single trace operator localized at some time. Of course, you have to smear it a little bit and so on and so forth. But well, schematically, this is what you, what you have. And uh, so we think of this state psi. Um, which is, a, this is not a, it's not a typical state anymore. It's somewhat atypical because we excited it by this unitary. And if you compute correlators of single trace operators on this state as a function of time, you find that they're time dependent. And in particular, uh, they start from some equilibrium value. They go out of equilibrium or some, ar around the time where you insert this guy, and they go back to equilibrium again. So from the bulk point of view, the interpretation of these states is pretty st straightforward, I think, uh, because they, uh, so at least in this part of the diagram, so you have a particle uh, whose nature is determined by this uh, unitary, which, is, uh, which emerges from the past horizon, it flies out some distance in ADS and falls back into the horizon. So the precise mapping between uh, the properties of this particle and this unitary can be worked out. For example, in some ASKLL-like uh, construction, so you, you know the, the properties of this particle in terms of this unitary. And the interpretation of the state is that uh, it is a very fine-tuned state. It's a special state which has been prepared in the past, and it has been prepared in precisely the right way so as to undergo a spontaneous fluctuation out of, out of equilibrium at around the time t equals zero. That's why we get this particle popping out and falling into the uh, future horizon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. No. So you have to make sure that uh, this state, this theta, is small enough so that uh, this unitary, if you expand it out in powers of theta, it will be dominated by relatively low, low line terms. Okay. So these are standard non-equilibrium states. There, I think there is nothing uh, surprising or controversial about these states. Uh, well, the only uh, controversial thing is whether this part of the geometry and this part of the, of the geometry makes sense, right? But this part is, is pretty standard, and you can verify it by computing CFT correlators on this state. Okay, so now let me uh, talk about some uh, states where we excite uh, only the left region, wh where nothing is visible in the, in the right region, right? So these are the, the states that we want to discuss. Uh, so the obvious way to do that is by acting with a unitary made out of these old tildes on, the on an equilibrium state, psi zero. So the naive guess would be that this will be similar to what we had before, the only difference that the particle will be moving in the left region. Now, the important point is that these states, uh, using the equations that we wrote down for these O-tilde operators, can be rewritten in the following way. 
So I wrote down some equations before defining the tilde operators, and uh, if you use those equations, uh, you can check that uh, this unitary made out of the tildes acting on the slip psi can be rewritten in terms of ordinary operators O and this conjugation with the Hamiltonian, with this exponential of the Hamiltonian. One important point is that, uh, which may be a bit confusing, is that this guy, O tilde, is state dependent. So it depends on the state psi, but on the right-hand side, the result does not. The, this operator does not depend on the state. It's always the same uh, operator for any any one of the possible typical states psi you can start with. So we notice that a state that you would get by acting with state-dependent operators, you can also construct by acting with ordinary operators. And well, that's uh, not very surprising, perhaps, if you think about it. But uh, the important ob observation here is that a state of this type has the property that it looks like an equilibrium state uh, by, if you probe it by single trace operators on the boundary. So it's a state which has some sort of excitation which is not visible in the CFT, so the natural conjecture would be that it's hidden behind the horizon in some way. So from now on, I want to study those states on their own right. So we, from, from this point on, uh, I don't need to think about these O-tilde operators. I want to explore the properties of these states which certainly exists in the Hilbert space of the theory, it's, it's, that's pretty clear. And I want to study the properties of those states, uh, and these properties are independent of the discussion uh, related to the tilde operators. So the claim is that uh, states of this type, where psi is a typical state, and you act with a unitary conjugated in this way, represent a somewhat unusual type of non-equilibrium non -equilibrium states, where these excitations are not visible uh, in simple correlators in this theory. Let me make an observation that acting with this uh, object uh, actually lowers the, the energy of the CFT, which is consistent with what I mentioned uh, earlier. So let me remind you that you can do something similar in flat space uh, if you take uh, Minkowski space in Rilner coordinates. And if you want to create an excitation in the, in the right wedge, you can do that by acting with a unitary made out of the local fields in that region. So this will create some excitation which moves in this part of the space time. Nothing is visible on the left wedge. Um, but then uh, there's a very nice, well, there's a, a nice way to um, create a, a, another state where this excitation is present in the left wedge instead of the right wedge, and this can be done in the following way. Uh, we notice that for Rindler space, the modular Hamiltonian is a Lorentz Bush generator, and the, uh, the temperature of this uh, decomposition is 2 pi. Uh, so uh, it is a fact in quantum field theory that if you take a unitary and you uh, act from the left and the right with this uh, complexified boost by parameter uh, pi, uh, you actually move the excitation on the left region, and uh, the state that you get in this way can also be written uh, in terms of un a unitary operator acting on the left wedge. So we can start with an excitation in the right wedge, and we can move it over to the left wedge by conjugating it with e to the, mi um, well, uh, e to the minus uh, be beta k over 2, where k is the modular Hamiltonian, and for this uh, example, the modular Hamiltonian is, is M, the boost generator, while for this example, uh, the CFT Hamiltonian acts in the small Hilbert space as the modular Hamiltonian. So it's similar. Of course, uh, this does not mean that you can reconstruct the operators on the left wedge. Uh, what you can do is you can reconstruct states which have excitation in the left wedge by uh, doing this procedure. So similarly, uh, in the black hole case, I'm not saying that you can uh, reconstruct the operators O tilde by doing this conjugation. I'm just saying that the states that you would get by acting with this uh, O tildes, you can also get in this way. So let me, uh, yeah. You can go all the way to the left, yes. There's no limit here, right? Because uh, there's some differences. So here, uh, the set of operators acting on the right wedge is a proper algebra without any cutoff. It's really an algebra in the sense that you can multiply uh, the operators as many times as you like. There's no restriction on the number of, of uh, factors in the product, like the one I introduced for the black hole, which was the number of operators to be small compared to capital N. Yeah. There's no cutoff in the frequency omega here, so this is somewhat different. So let me now uh, show that uh, why the states seem to be in equilibrium with respect to small algebra. So we start with a typical state and we act with this object, and then we want to compute correlators of single trace operators on the state. Well, uh, yeah, so we take A to be a simple operator in the theory, and the expectation value of A will be given by this quantity. Uh, I insert this in the Brian Kett. 
And so then we have a product of various operators and uh, evaluated on a typical state. Uh, and then I can approximate this result by um, putting everything in the thermal trace. So we know that in general, uh, expectation values of operators uh, on a typical pure state are the same as thermal expectation values up to corrections which are suppressed by the entropy. So you can replace this pure state correlator by a thermal trace. And then you notice that something nice happens. These factors of e to the minus beta h and uh, beta h by 2 cancel uh, using the cyclicity of the trace, the UNU dagger cancel, and you get back uh, the thermal expectation value up to 1 over s corrections. Yes. That you have here. Is it, is it clear it holds for this uh, operator, which uh, might be complicated? Or? Right. So uh, I think uh, because I, I introduced this restriction on the frequencies omega, when I write down this unitary made out of O, I want to think of a unitary which has support only on a certain range in frequencies. And uh, as a result, when you conjugate it with this uh, Hamiltonian, uh, you will get a, a, you know, a finite number of factors of e to the beta omega. I, I, uh, but omega is bounded. So I think uh, you can control the error term uh, in this approximation. And uh, if these operators do not have very high frequencies, then, uh, then you're good. OK, so we notice that these states, when you probe them by the, probe them by the small algebra, you don't notice uh, anything. They seem to be in equilibrium. Uh, however, um, if you include the Hamiltonian in the set of operators that you can use to probe the state, you can actually see that the states are out of equilibrium. And uh, I don't want to go into details, uh, but basically, if you uh, do the same calculation, including the Hamiltonian inside the correlator, uh, this, this Ham the Hamiltonian is scaled with a factor of n squared. So certain corrections that you well, this one of the corrections that we ignored before uh, now become important because they get multiplied by n squared. Uh, but the important thing is that by a certain manipulation you can do, you can actually uh, reliably extract the, uh, the first correction, which comes by multiplying the n squared of the Hamiltonian with this one over n squared. And for instance, uh, for a simple uh, excitation of this type, you can f show that at large n, um, this, uh, this correlator has this particular form, which then turns out to be time dependent. And it has a property that it has a, a peak around the time t naught, and it decays in the, far, in the past and the future. So then the interpretation of the state is that it's an out of equilibrium state. However, uh, using simple operators in this theory, we cannot detect this particle. Uh, but we could detect it if we also use the Hamiltonian. So it's certainly a non equilibrium state. For example, you can do this calculation a bit more precisely if you take a two-dimensional CFT and uh, um, at large central charge, and if you assume the theory has a sparse spectrum and so on and so forth, you can compute this correlator uh, for a primary of dimension delta, and you find there is some signal around the time t naught. Okay, so let me make some comments about the states. Uh, this operator uh, is not a unitary, right? Because if you take the dagger, it's not the same operator. Um, I mean, it's not a unitary, sorry. Uh, however, the state that you get by acting with this guy on a typical state has no one up to one over s corrections. So to prove that, you, you, what you need to do is to compute the norm of the state. And as what we did before, you replace the expectation value in the pure state by thermal expectation value. And then these factors cancel, and you find 1 plus 1 over s corrections. So the state that you get by acting with this guy is a normalized state. And it, it, there's a small mistake which you can fix by adjusting the normalization. Uh, uh, there's another puzzle that uh, uh, sometimes may be a bit confusing. Uh, w the claim is that this guy lowers the energy of a typical state. At the same time, this is an invertible operator, right? So it does not annihilate any states. So how is that possible, uh, given that there are more states at high energies and fewer states at lower energies, right? You might think that an invertible operator cannot possibly do that. But of course, the point is that this is actually possible because uh, this, the thing that this operator does is that it lowers only the expectation value of the states. In particular, while the typical states that we started with had a very sharp um, support on the energy, the states that you get by acting with this guy have a spread in energy. And in that sense, they're borrowing phase space from the higher energy uh, states. Uh, however, the low energy components are enhanced, and thus the expectation value of the energy is decreased. Yeah. The, the right side has the same metric, so it doesn't have, you don't see the signature at the EMS, or how, do, how is that? 
ADMS system? You don't see what? The ADMS on the right side should no, no. be the same. Uh, so the, no, the ADMS is lowered a little bit when you so, insert this excitation. So the metric on the right side... Yeah, the metric uh, is, 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 is changed, but by a very small factor, right? By one over n squared kind of term. Because uh, these excitations have energy of order one, so their back reaction to the metric is of order... Uh, I mean, the metric changes... Let's say the radius of the horizon changes by order one over n squared. So uh, in case you're, you're, you, you find this a bit confusing, uh, well, this is a little um, example in the SYK model. So let's take the SYK model, start with a typical pure state. So here we see the distribution of the, the coefficients. These are the coefficients CI that I defined earlier, uh, the projection of the state on the energy eigenstates. And you start with a typical state, which has sharply picked energy around some points, and then you can excite it in two different ways. By acting with a usual unitary, this O um, could be made out of the fermions of the SPK model or some combination of the fermions. And uh, if you do that, of course, you find that you get a state uh, where the spread over all possible energies. Uh, but then you can also try to see what happens if you act on this type of state. And you find that, again, uh, the typical state moves over to this state here, which has spread over all energy states, all energy eigenstates. However, oops, the low energy components are, are enhanced. That's why the overall energy of the state has, has, has gone down. So uh, at this point, we have identified a class of non-equilibrium states which are present in any statistical system. And the proposal is that in a holographic CFT, these states may correspond to excitations uh, behind the horizon, so in the left region of the, of the diagram. And uh, the number of those states is parameterized by this unitary. And in the, um, as I mentioned briefly, this unitary can have many different forms. You can use an SKLL-like construction to uh, find the mapping between bulk fields, bulk excitations, and the type of unitary. So in that sense, the possible ways to excite the state corresponds to the possible ways of exciting the, that region in effect field theory. And the an important point is that even though we were motivated uh, to f identify the states by using these O-tilde operators, the existence and the properties of those states is independent of the O tilde construction. So these states definitely exist in the, in the Hilbert space of the theory, and the question is if the interpretation we have given to the states is the correct one. So can we have, find some more uh, evidence for this interpretation? So uh, this is a, one of those states. Uh, if you act on this state with a time translation, uh, it starts to look like this, right? So now uh, we have this particle which is uh, trying to get out, but it can't, so it falls into singularity. So uh, it's very tempting to uh, consider, uh, try to apply a protocol like the one that uh, Juan explained in the previous lectures, where, uh, which is based on uh, the gauge jefferies uh, wall uh, idea, which is to try to create a negative energy shockwave that will uh, intersect this particle and uh, make it uh, move out into the right region where it can get detected by ordinary operators in the CFT. So the question we want to ask now is how are we going to produce this negative energy shockwave in this situation? I remind you we have only one CFT, there is no second CFT, so you cannot just do all left times all right. However, these operators of tilde were designed uh, precisely uh, in such a way that the correlators of O left and O right are almost the same as the correlators of O and O tilde. So the natural guess is that you take the Hamiltonian, the CFT Hamiltonian, and you perturb it at time, let's say, t equals zero by a, a product of this form, O tilde. So the hope is that this would create a negative energy shockwave which would allow the particle to escape and get detected in the CFT. Let me make some comments. Uh, so, if we want to do this protocol, we would have to use the state-dependent operators, right? Uh, but let me make some comments. I want to argue that uh, using these state-dependent operators on the boundary uh, fits within the standard framework of quantum mechanics uh, in the following sense. We can imagine that we have many identically prepared systems all in the same state psi, and then the boundary observer can uh, use many of those systems to perform measurements and, well, by collecting the data from all those measurements, he can identify the exact pure state psi. Then, uh, the observer can take one of the remaining systems, which have not been measured, but we know it's in the same state. So, we have a system which is in the state psi, and we know that it's in the state psi, and we know the state. So, we can definitely prepare a device which will effectively act with uh, any operator we like on this particular system. So, I think there's no... Uh, uh, well, it seems to me this is like standard quantum mechanics. There is no uh, discussion whether we can do this or not. I mean, there, there is no um, problem unless there are objections. 
Uh, so what remains as a non-trivial question is whether the infonic bulk observer can use uh, these state-dependent operators to perform quantum measurements, but this, this is something different, because now we're talking about the boundary observer. Yes. Ensemble thing, so what you're doing is you first do enough measurements to figure out what size is, and then yes. construct the O tilde and act on another exactly. element of the ensemble. That's right. That's right. Okay, so I don't need to review this uh, this uh, um, protocol, uh, but let me just say that uh, one way to uh, to test this um, traversability, uh, as was discussed in detail in this paper by Juan collaborators, is to uh, write down some correlators. For example, uh, in the case of a thermophile state, you create a probe on the left by acting with, with this type of unitary, and then uh, at time t equals zero, you act with a double trace perturbation, and then later on the right side, you try to detect the particle by measuring an operator phi r. So all in all, what you need to compute is some, well, some commutator of this type. And uh, <coughs> this contains out-of-time order commutators, <coughs> which have the property that they grow exponentially, and so on and so forth. And uh, now we will have a similar type of computation in a one-sided CFT. So, so what we want to do is we want to create this particle on the left, which we can think of either as a particle which... So we can think of uh, one of those non-equilibrium states I was talking about. Uh, here I have written it in terms of phi tilde, but as I already explained, you can rewrite the state in terms of uh, phi without the tilde. <clears throat> now, okay, there's some technicalities. This operator has to smear, be smeared a little bit because of this cutoff. That's not very important. Uh, the point is that if, if that's the only thing you do, as I already explained, this excitation is invisible in CFT correlators. So uh, we want to add the shock waves now, and uh, at time t equals zero, we perturb the Hamiltonian by this uh, perturbation. And uh, you can ask what is the effect of this perturbation. Uh, you can start from this part of the diagram where it is not, uh, it's, it's straightforward because you can basically repeat the same calculation of Jaffer's wall to calculate the induced uh, bulk stress tensor because of this perturbation, everything will work out in the same way at large n because the commutators between O tilde, O tilde, O tilde, O, o are the same as O left or right. So this part of the calculation will be identical, which means we can uh, reliably say that there's a shock wave, negative energy shock wave in this part of the diagram if we select G in the, in the right way. Uh, what is a conjecture is that there's also another shock wave coming from this region. Well, you can calculate the shock wave if you use uh, a construction like that we did with Suvrat, where you can write down the local bulk fields in these regions, and you can uh, compute how the correlators of that field change because of perturbation, and by point splitting, you can get T mu in that region as well. Anyway, putting everything together, we have this experiment. We have this, part, this probe, which was created by this operator, and then at time t equals zero, we perturb the CFT by this uh, double trace perturbation, and then, so it's not double trace, I'm sorry. This is not a single trace operator, but it's the analog of a double trace perturbation. And then at late times, we will detect this particle. So all in all, we need to compute a correlator which is very similar to the ones that uh, we saw in the previous slide about the thermophile state. And then, if this Penrose diagram, this conjecture Penrose diagram makes sense, then a prediction of this diagram is that the CFT correlator will show a definite signal at some time t, uh, which is of the order of scrambling time. So if we find a way of computing this correlator in the CFT, and if we find that the signal is there, that's, that's, that's um, a necessary condition for this diagram to make sense, for this conjecture to make sense. So I want to find a way of like estimating this correlator. Um, so there's some subtleties I will mention only if there are questions. So I will try to compare these correlators in the two-sided and the one-sided case. So in the two-sided case, we have this object, right? Uh, if you look at this correlator as a function of time, you get the signal at some point. So here, you can simplify this correlator in the following way. On the thermophile state, there are some equations that the le left operators obey, which are uh, identically true. I mean, which are exactly true. If you act with a left operator on the thermophile state, you can rewrite the result in terms of the right operators. The left and right commute, and so on and so forth. So there are some relations which allow you. Uh, you take one of the left operators, you move it all the way to the right. It it, go, it can pass through other right operators because they commute. Then it acts on the thermophile state. You convert it into a right operator. And you can keep doing the same thing uh, again and again mm -hmm. until you convert all of these left operators into right operators. If you do that, you get some uh, very complicated object, chi, uh, which is made out of uh, phi's and uh, o's on the right CFT only. There is no left operator. And these phi's and o's are not at the same moment in time. They are separated in time, right? However, so the correlator we want to study in the two-sided case can be reduced to this correlator here. Uh, 
And uh, now, since everything is on the right CFT, we can trace out the left CFT, so we get a thermal correlator in a single conformal field theory made out of where we have some complicated string here of operators phi no. Let's move over to the uh, uh, one sided case. We have a similar correlator, uh, C prime, and um, these operators of tilde were defined in such a way that uh, basically they obey the same properties as uh, the, the ones of the thermal field state. So you can follow the same procedure uh, of uh, moving the otillas to the right, converting them into O's by using these equations. And, well, as you can imagine, you end up with exactly the same um, complicated string chi. The only difference is that now this object is evaluated on a typical pure state. But otherwise, it's exactly the same as the one we had before. So, uh, in the two-sided case, we know that if we do follow this protocol, we will get a particle uh, here. What we want to know is whether the same result will be true in the one-sided case. So, what we need to know is whether the correlators C and C prime are close to each other. So, we want to compare these two correlators. So, we have some complicated product, uh, combination of products and linear combinations of phi's and O's localized at different times. And uh, we want to evaluate the same thing in the thermal ensemble and the typical pure state. Now, we can simplify it a little bit more because uh, in statistical mechanics, there is a very robust way of approximating uh, typical state correlators by correlators in the microcanonical ensemble. And I want to emphasize that in this approximation, the error term is exponentially small. So this type of approximation is better than the one we used before, where we approximate the typical state by the thermal ensemble. Here, we're approximating it by the microcanonical ensemble, and this is very robust, and the error term will be really, really tiny. So instead of comparing these two guys, it is sufficient to compare the expectation value of this complicated object in the canonical and the microcanonical ensembles. So what we hope, what we want in order for the Penrose diagram to make sense is that um, in the larger limit, these two correlators have the same limit. That's a ne necessary condition. You may think this is trivial because we're trying to compare uh, expectation value in the thermal ensemble and microcanonical ensemble, but it's not entirely trivial because, uh, for example, there's no general proof that expectation values in these two ensembles have to be the same. For instance, if you compute the trace distance between these two ensembles, the trace dis distance is almost maximal, which means that in principle you can always find operators which have different, very different expectation values in the two ensembles. So the, question, the real question is whether this observable chi is a reasonable observable, in the sense that it has almost the same expectation value in thermal and uh, in the th canonical and the microcanonical ensembles. And it's not obvious that this is true because this chi is a very complicated observable which is made out of the products of uh, single trace operators separated by, uh, by large time separations of the order of scambling time. So when C and C prime are equal, then only you can interpret that uh, in the one-sided case phi t is observed. Yeah, that's right. So this is only true in the large n or? Uh... Well, I, I want to start with large n, right? I mean, uh, I, I want to say this particle at least in the larger limit. Now, this conjecture that these two limits are the same is sort of related to the uh, statement that this object chi, which is a product of many operators separated by large time, uh, obeys the uh, ETH. Uh, but actually, we don't care about the off-diagonal elements because these are diagonal density matrices, so they drop out completely. What we mean is that um, the diagonal elements are slowly varying with the energy. In particular, we need that the derivative of these guys with respect to the energy is suppressed by 1 over s. Now, usually this is true in, a, in a large gauge theories uh, because uh, one way to understand it is that uh, these uh, expectation values usually depend on the energy by the temperature. And these two have a factor of n squared between them. So derivative with respect to temperature is order 1. So derivative with respect to the energy is suppressed by 1 over n squared for, for, for a simple uh, single trace operators. We don't know if this is true for this complicated guy. Another way of saying that why this is non-trivial is that uh, the interesting effect which allows a particle to escape is that we have this, uh, these corrections which get enhanced, these one over n corrections which get enhanced by uh, these exponentially growing factors at scrambling time. So they start off as one over n corrections, but at scrambling time they become factors of order one. So now the question is, are these chaos enhanced one over n corrections the same in the two ensembles? So that, that, that's the meaning of this, uh, of this uh, equality. So it's not, I don't know if you think it's obvious or not. Uh, I, I, I cannot see a way of proving it. So uh, let me make some comments. Uh, it is generally expected, though I don't think there's a proof, that if you have uh, 
operators, which each one of them obeys the ETAs, then if you multiply them together, the product will obey the ETAs. I, I, I don't think there's a proof of the statement, but it's a general expectation. Uh, if you take the limit where you take these, two, these operators and you separate them in time by a huge factor, much longer than scrambling time, so you separate them to the point where you can assume that their matrix elements are totally uncorrelated, then you can actually prove that the product will obey the ETAs. So we have a situation where we expect uh, ETAs to hold for products for very early times. Uh, we can show that it will, under some assumptions, that it also holds for very late times. So it's perhaps natural to expect that it will hold for intermediate times as well. In two-dimensional CFTs at loud C and with sparse spectrum, there are some arguments uh, in this paper that you can, um, um, if you have out-of-time ordered operators, you can convert them um, into time-ordered ones by using some operator equations, which are supposed to be true in all states. And uh, if you uh, accept these arguments, then uh, and if you accept that uh, time-ordered correlators do not have exponential growth, then uh, I think you get uh, this prediction again. Finally, uh, we have done some very, uh, really preliminary and uh, uh, basic numerical tests in the SYK model. So we're not very good at this, and we could only go to very small value of n. But for example, if you compute uh, something like this, some uh, commutator squared, and if you compute it in a thermal state and in a typical pure state, uh, well, there are two curves here, a red and a blue one, but you don't see the difference because they are on top of each other. So it seems to be in, in, in reasonable agreement that you get the same result in a typical pure state, in a thermal state, even if the time separation is, is long. Uh, or you can try to calculate the diagonal matrix elements of an object like this in the SYK model um, when the time separation is, 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 is large. And these are the matrix elements. and um, here, these lines, the red lines, indicate the width of the microcanonical ensemble, and the blue lines indicate the width of the canonical ensemble. And you find that uh, these matrix elements are approximately, well, they don't vary a lot within uh, this domain, which means that the approximation between the two ensembles will be, will be good. OK, so uh, ideally, we would also like to do the full thing uh, numerically to uh, set up this experiment in SYK and perturb it, uh, well, try to see if we get a signal uh, at late times, but this is uh, uh, numerically more difficult. Uh, and uh, I, I will show this diagram, but please don't take it seriously. Um, you, we are computing the one-point function of this guy in the presence of all the perturbations. And uh, well, it seems you get some, some bump uh, at around scrambling time, but uh, this is not very reliable because our n for this calculation is at this point is, is very small. OK, in the last three minutes, uh, I will talk a little bit about this uh, hyden preskill uh, connection. So here the question is, if we throw a qubit into a black hole, how long do we have to wait to uh, extract the information from the, from the Hawking radiation? So obviously, one thing you can do is can you wait until the black hole evaporates completely, and then you can do it. But this is a very long time scale. And what hyden preskill uh, realized is that uh, there is a better way to do it. If you, if you have access to more than half of the Hawking radiation, because in that case, you only need to wait for uh, scrambling time, and you just collect a few more particles. And in principle, you can. Uh, find the decoding operation that will allow you to extract the information. So more technically, what you need to show is that you start with the, so after the pain time, after half of the black hole has evaporated, um, the remaining black hole is maximally entangled with uh, the radiation which has been emitted before. And then you can uh, throw a qubit into the black hole. And this qubit, for convenience, we can imagine it's maximally entangled with a reference qubit n. <coughs> Uh, sorry, this figure is for, from the paper of Hayden Preskill. Uh, so we have this reference uh, qubit. In the beginning, this qubit is entangled with the black hole because the, its partner has fallen into the black hole. Then under time evolution, these two guys mix with some complicated unitary, and then radiation comes out and is combined with the early radiation. And what they showed is that uh, the entanglement of N swaps over to this side very quickly after you remove some of these particles R. <laughs> And then there's a very beautiful uh, uh, reinterpretation, um, realization of this protocol given in this paper of one collaborators in terms of traversable wormholes, which is that the following: we have this evaporating black hole, we collect half, uh, the, uh, ha at least half of the Hawking radiation, and make it collapse into a second black hole. Then uh, these two black holes will be entangled. Then, in principle, you can try to uh, apply some complicated unitary to bring them into a thermophile-like state. Then the two uh, are internally connected by some geometric wormhole. Then um, Alice can throw this qubit into the ori original black hole. Uh, 
And um, well, you have to imagine the eternal black hole now, and then using something like a double. So now the analog of a double trace coupling uh, is uh, the fact that we extract a few more particles from one side and we put them on the other side. And in this way, uh, the qubit emerges in geometric form on uh, the second black hole, which, which was created by the collapse. So there's something uh, similar uh, uh, we can do with these mirror operators. It's not exactly the same, but there's some, some similarity. So we start with a typical black hole in equilibrium, and then at some early time we throw a qubit uh, into the black hole, and then we want to recover the information. So what I'm going to tell you is not the unique way to do it. There are other ways to do it. This is one way to do it. So we throw this qubit at early times, and then at later time we act this double trace perturbation that I defined, uh, which creates these negative energy shock waves, and which extracts the qubit and it displaces it into this region. And then you can try to measure this qubit by measuring the operator phi tilde uh, on this side. Uh, I mean, phi tilde is supported in the original CFT. It's a complicated operator, and geometrically we can represent it in this region. So uh, anyway, so this uh, quantity is measured by a correlator of this type, which is very similar to the one we had before, uh, with a role of fine phi tilde reversed. And uh, even in the original Heisen Preskill protocol, um, in order to apply it, you have to assume that you know the quantum state of the black hole. Right? So this is related to the fact that if you want to be able to work with so tilde operators, you need to know the microstate. Summarize. So we consider the possibility that uh, typical black hole microstates in ADS extend partly to the left region. And uh, this was motivated by identifying certain non-equilibrium states which can uh, be naturally identified with excitations in that region. And we try to use this one, a one-sided version of the, this protocol to extract the excitation and verify the, the conjecture. And more technically, we derive some necessary conditions for CFT correlators at scrambling time in order for this uh, conjecture geometry to be correct. Of course, even if these correlators have the properties that I mentioned, th this does not prove that this region has a physical meaning. And in order to fully address the problem, we have to understand uh, quantum mechanics of the bulk observer which, uh, but I don't have anything to add uh, regarding that problem. Thank you. Yes. I was wondering if you could reinterpret this condition you have between the microcanonical and the canonical expectation values in the following sense. So suppose you compute a two-point function in the canonical density matrix. These guys are exactly periodic in imaginary time. In the canonical, yes. In the canonical. In the yeah. microcanonical, it's not. And, and in particular, if you try to analytically right. continue the microcanonical answer as a fun into imaginary time, mm -hmm. you will see a deviation the moment you go into the complex plane. Yeah. Because this is, is this the same, effectively the same thing? but for more complicated operators? Well, I think that's a point I, I was planning to mention, but I didn't, uh, which is uh, that uh, in order, when I say that these correlators have to be similar, actually we need that these correlators are similar even on the complex, in the complex plane. Oh, no, I don't know how to find it now. Um, uh, yes, but also uh, in principle, if you, I, I use this typicality argument that uh, on a typical state, the correlators are very close to the microcanonical, right? I don't think this argument applies to an analytically continued correlators because even if you have a very small uh, noise term, right? If if to um, right, if you have a very small noise term, it can get amplified by a huge factor when you analytically continue. But the important thing is that for everything I talked about, I always assume that I'm looking at modes with omega less than omega star, where omega star is some large but finite frequency. Which means that when you analytically continue those correlators, you don't need to analytically continue the exact correlator, but only the low pass filtered one, where you throw away the high frequencies and you only consider the low frequencies. So, uh, because of that, I think that some of these approximations uh, between different ensembles or of different of pure states and ensembles in the complex plane may be under control. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Kirikos again. So